For more than 20 years, CTV has captured the moments that matter in our community. From our studios in St. Clair, you're watching Focus with Paul Dingaman. Welcome to another edition of the Focus program. My name is Paul Dingaman. You are going to be happy today when you hear about our guest, Dan Lockwood. He's got some great information about a wonderful evening. It's coming up just around the corner and it's going to be at LaCroix Riverside Pub. Then later today in today's program, we're going to check in from a uh, meeting that was held uh, this last week out at Cotterville Township where uh, the emergency management uh, uh, leader, Mr. Justin Westmiller, uh, gave the Cotterville Township Board an update on the St. Clair River and all the water. Really important report, and I think you'll be interested in that. It'll be right after we say hello to Dan Lockwood. Nice Good to day, see sir. you, buddy. Nice to see you. Um, you are such a busy guy, and you always have fun things happening. Uh, throughout for all the years I've known you, you've been doing that so stuff, and that's no different this week, is it? No, it's not. Uh, as you said earlier, the uh, whistles in the water will be happened on Wednesday on January. Whistles on the water? I'm sorry. I, I, I mentioned that yeah, to you, yeah. and I did that on purpose. The Winter White House Poetry uh, Songwriting right. Contest will be held on Wednesday, January 22nd, 7 p.m. at LaCroix. And as we've done in the past, we have another legend which we ask our local poets and songwriters to create a ballad or a poem for. Um, we've had a lot of success. Oh, you really have. Leggers. And um, we're going back to the bootleggers time this year. So it's really interesting. Uh, the event started, what, five, 10 years ago? 11, year, this 11 year, years 11, ago. 11 years ago. And I remember that first year we were very, very cold. <laughs> and we were down by the, by the water, by the Pine River, and you gave me a, uh, imitation bottle of booze with Coca-Cola in it or something and I poured the crisp in the water yep. with the booze and then we went and got warm in LaCroix probably. probably yeah. uh, over the years you've had very great success in finding singers and uh, poetry people and uh, you have always give them an assignment what's the assignment this year? Well, as I said before, we're going back to uh, St. Clair's history uh, with bootlegging. Right. So before I tell you the legend, let's just go back and review how we found yeah. most of this information. Uh, you remember Jerry Amick? Yeah, uh, a wonderful Jerry guy. Jerry was a real estate agent, but he was also Justice of Peace in yep. St. Clair. And Jerry, when he was actually involved in the Historic Museum for St. Clair, he got the idea that maybe they should start interviewing some of the older population at okay. that time. And this was back when... Jerry wasn't old. Right. So he and somebody else got a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and they started taping people about their experiences growing up in St. Clair. And he interviewed two people, uh, nicknames are Frenchie and Blink, who were bootleggers. <laughs> they started off as teenagers when Prohibition started and um, stayed with it for the whole time. And you got to realize when Prohibition started, uh, most of the people who were involved in bootlegging were just the local people trying to earn a few extra dollars. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Fishermen take his boat across and bring it back, and you know, it really a few caused, cases of beer, or booze, yeah, a few and that'd be it. Beer and like this, but you know, there were money, money involved. And right. they, made, they made a good money on a haul. Mm -hmm. So what happened was it started to um, consolidate. It's the best way of saying, it. just like you talk about big corporations. <laughs> Guys would come in and it started to get real serious. And, you know, quite frankly, this is why the FBI was formed. <coughs> really? So we started. So Jerry's got these interviews for these uh, gentlemen. And one of the stipulations when they gave the interview was that the tapes would not be released until after they had died. Wonderful. So they died, uh, I want to say, about 15 years ago. I heard about the tapes. And... One of the things when Jerry was just the piece, he had his scribe. Oh. So th the interview was around 60 or 70 pages. And so what we've done is we've gone through and we've picked up portions of this and we've pieced them together into a story. So there's always a, a, a section of fact in it. And then we've uh, spun it into a story. They go. So having said that, one of the issues, which we kind of alluded to last year and a couple of the years, is the local police department. Exactly what do you do? Because as I said earlier, these are your local, your neighbors. Right. 
who right. earn a few extra dollars trying to pay the rent, get food on the table. Right. I mean, they're not driving around in Cadillacs or anything like that. Right. That was the guys from the outside who were doing that. Right. So it's a dilemma with the local guys. You know, do they get involved? Do they not get involved? How aggressively do they support the feds? So there was a police chief by the name of Ed Sass. It's a, a name that's been around the St. Clair County yeah. for a long time. And Ed, at this point, we have a tough time determining what's fact and what's fiction. But in our stories, uh, Ed spent some time up in the UP as a logger. Okay. And uh, he had an accident up there, and he, uh, his leg was broken. Well, during this time period, you have to realize that workman's comp was not legalized. And mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. if you were injured on the job, literally a collection was taken up from the fellow workers. Maybe the owner would throw some money in, and that's, and that's how you survived until you could go back to work. Mm -hmm. Well, in this particular case, uh, the gentleman who collected the money was Ed Kromnicker. Ed, most people might know him now as Father Kromnicker. But oh, okay. in his teenage years, he was a lumberjack up in the UP. So in our story, they knew each other. In fact, Ed was the one who uh, collected the money for... Uh, this is fun Ed. stuff. This is fun and, stuff. And it's just amazing yeah, how this stuff yeah. fits together. So as we go through, at the same time, it's just coincidental, but in 1919, St. Mary's Church had a fire in it. Mm -hmm. And it just so coincidentally, 100 years later, it had a fire. Had another in it. fire. By the way, we wrote the legend before, before the fire. Before the fire? <laughs> the fire okay. took So uh, they, there was a lot of questioning about how the church was going to raise the money for the uh, replace the church. Ed Sass happened to be at the Knights of Columbus one time, and somebody was passing around a, a list of donors. He looked at the list. He didn't really think anything of it, but afterwards he had second thoughts. And he said, you know, there were a couple names on there that surprised him. So he went back before the meeting was in and looked at it a second time, and he suddenly realized that what surprised him was there were a lot of bootleggers and <laughs> live pig operators who were making donations to the church. And a couple of them, he didn't think they belonged to the congregation. So he was real curious about this. And the more he thought about it, he started to think about some incidents that took place. And Father Cromnector seemed to have a really good insight into the details of this. Some of these things <laughs> that he didn't think he should know. Right. So he was contemplating meeting with Father Cromnector to find out how he knew this information. And he was concerned that the possibility that Father Cromnector might be selling protection. <laughs> so we've kind of left it up to the creator to come right. up and finish the story. Well, it's a great, a great story to start with. I mean, the imagination can really run wild with a story with a Catholic priest and a, and a bootlegger, and oh my God, that, that's it, good. It's just, and like I said, there's a couple incidents which we talk, you know, one of the incidents was interesting Somehow, and I found this in a Detroit News article, but the bootleggers figured out a way to stop a boat almost immediately. Stop a boat? Stop a boat. They can run it at full speed, and typically when you try to stop it, you reverse and it's right. close for a half mile or something right. like this. Well, they were able to stop it. And, and why would they want to do that? Well, I'm going to tell you. So the story that I'm reading, again, came is... Um, French and Blink were, zip, were bringing a load across the river, and the uh, Coast Guard was on them. Okay. They literally stopped in front of Frank Moore's boathouse. Okay. Pulled into the boathouse, unloaded their stuff, got it into a truck. When the Coast Guard, by the time the Coast Guard stopped their boat, turned around and came back, they were leaving the boathouse, and the truck was leaving the driveway. Oh my God, that was they were quick. They were quick. So they were like I said. So yes, why they did it? Yeah. So it just cute things like that. Yeah. Okay. So the the authors, uh, the balladeers, they have been preparing for a while to to come to Lacroix on a Wednesday night. Yes, sir. What happens at Lacroix? Well, at Lacroix, we go through and they actually present their entry. And their entry is this story. The poet. The poem or the song. Okay. And we have a series of judges who oh. will go through and determine who is 
number one, number two, or number three. And I need to say that the number one person is named St. Clair's Poet Laureate for 2020, and the number one songwriter is named um, po or St. Clair's uh, Balladeer. Bootlegger Balladeer. Right. Thank you. And then on top of that, we have a gentleman who's uh, uh, donated money to the Rotary Club. And we will be, the Rotary Club will be giving cash prizes. Oh, my God. Cash, too. So uh, first prize. They can is, buy the house around. They could. <laughs> first prize is 250 Second is 150 And third is $100. So there's a little cash prize. And oh, there's good. A little, now, the only stipulation is, is they have to come to the council meeting. It's the first council meeting in February, which I believe the date is February 3rd. And they have to make their... The winners have to, uh, again, present their uh, entry. And at that time, the mayor will present them with their proclamation, naming them the Bootlegger Balladeer or the Poet Laureate. Uh, that's always a great, a great evening, too. But let's go back to uh, LaCroix. Um, you, you mentioned that they get the title uh, uh, Balladeer or Poet Laureate. Uh, I heard you talking with Paul Miller the other morning, and you said that that is the only one in the state of Michigan that you know no, of? No, no, I didn't say to Michigan. He said that. Oh, he said uh, that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's the only one in the state of Michigan. I will, because I know the state of Michigan has a poet laureate. Okay. Um, we're probably the only one in St. Clair County, and we're probably the only one in the Blue Water area. Okay. And we'll just leave it at that. And you've had uh, some repeats over the years of... We've had uh, some repeats, but you know, the other thing important to point out is you don't have to live in St. Clair. Last year's winners... Uh, was Art Smith, who lives up in Port yep. Huron, and... Um, yeah, we had him Mark. On. Yeah, Mark Donnelly, who um, lives in Royal Oak. Happens to be, uh, I think, a brother or a nephew related to Sheriff Donnelly. Okay, okay. And over the years, Mike Mercantant is... Yeah, uh, Mike, and he's won his, a couple uh, times. A couple times, so... It's a good group and a funny... Thing, but you, uh, you have to get to LaCroix Pub early because they have limited seating, and there's no admission charge or anything, but... But uh, you have to, have to get there early in order to get a good seat. Yep. Uh, the other thing I would tell them is if they go to the uh, St. Clair and the River website, they will find uh, Whistles on, or uh, Winter White Out <laughs> Poet Laureate Contest. And from there, they can d download the legend, and there also is an entry form. So the information they need to enter the uh, event would be there. Okay, very good. Mr. Lockwood, thank you, thank you for all you do for the community. You're uh, an active kind of guy. We'll be back uh, with our next uh, segment in just a second. Well, the, this last week, uh, Cotterville Township had a, uh, their regular monthly uh, board meeting, and they invited Justin Westmiller, who is the Emergency Manager, Homeland Security Representative for St. Clair County. And he gave a very good up-to-the-minute uh, report about the water levels in uh, St. Clair County. He mentioned uh, part of it that in the state of Michigan, um, the water table is at 175% of capacity. So there is no place for the water to go. Uh, he's going to. Uh, this is the copy of, uh, of his speech, his presentation at the uh, Cotterville Township Board. I think you'll enjoy it. Take a listen. Okay, we have two speakers this evening. Um, Mr. Justin Westmiller, he's the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Man Management. So, if you don't mind, we'll start with uh, Mr. Westmiller. If you'd please uh, give us an update and for our board and our citizens on the winter ice blockage. Thank you all for having me. Uh, so I want to just give everybody a quick update on where we are with what we thought was going to be ice in the river, and we're very lucky to not have that right now. So we'll just talk a little bit about water levels and where we think we're going to be for the summertime. So what you have in front of you is a PowerPoint breakout on if we do end up having some ice in the river, what we think we can expect with the high water levels. So uh, we're gonna jump around a little bit. I'm probably not gonna follow that a little bit. That's just for your notes. Uh, and we'll just kind of talk about where we are and what we think we can expect, not only throughout the rest of the winter, but going into the spring and summer. And so the other document you have is the Lake St. Clair water levels, six month forecast going into June. Uh, and they put out a six month forecast every month from the Army Corps of Engineers. So uh, back in October, all of the southeastern Michigan emergency managers, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Canadian Coast Guard, the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Weather Service, and 
um, and a couple of other agencies got together along with the MHSD from the Michigan State Police, got together and had a meeting to talk about what we were going to do with high water levels and how ice, heavy ice, was going to affect that. Um, and right now our water level is back to where it was in August of 2019 as of last, as of yesterday. So the four inches approximate rain that we got throughout the Great Lakes system in the last seven days has caused us to be back to where we were in August of last year. We were at 577.14 as of an hour and a half ago. So we are in a significantly distressed situation for water level right now, especially in your area here, uh, basically from East China south all the way through the end of the county. Um, so we're keeping a heavy eye on that. At this point, we know that the mean lake water level is going to continue to climb from the first week in January all the way through the end of summer now. Uh, there is no more declination, uh, no more decline until we get through the, the summer and into the fall of next year now. We are on the rise. So every time we get a runoff situation, uh, we will continue to build on that water level. Uh, that's kind of where we are right now. So. The, one of the big things we're worried about through the rest of the winter is if we start to get a hard freeze, we will build heavy ice and that could pile up over top of the break walls and into people's properties. So what we've asked the Coast Guard to do is be cognizant of that because we know that depending on where they are with their four to five icebreakers that they have in our system and our half of the Great Lakes here uh, in an operation they call Operation Coal Shovel is for them to know that down here in the flats, uh, it's a very significant problem and we need them to be able to make sure they can break off and get here as quickly as possible. It could be up to an eight hour transit and we know that that could do an awful lot of damage in eight hours. So they have assured us that they understand that uh, it could be very damaging in eight hours and they will get here as quickly as possible. Uh, we are resource constrained as far as icebreakers in this area. Uh, if you remember back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, we had like 10 icebreakers available. Well, we don't have that anymore. We have five. So uh, there's, once they close the locks, and they just closed them yesterday, they can't get any more around. They can't get them out of Superior, and they also can't get them through the St. Lawrence Seaway anymore. So uh, we're stuck with five. So, uh, so we worked with them to kind of come up with a plan on what an exigent circumstance is and what that means. Does that mean water laying in yards? Well, no, we've got that right now. That means water into the first floor of homes. It doesn't mean in the basement. It doesn't mean in the crawl space. It means in the first floor of homes. So we kind of came up with what definitions were, where we were going to really raise the flag and start standing on our chairs and waving our arms and things like that. So that's kind of where we are right now. Um, so as far as ice and dealing through the rest of the winter, that's where we're going to be. Um, I am the first phone call if you have uh, significant uh, freezing water issues where that's starting to cause damage into the first floor of homes. So as supervisor, if you can just give me a call if one of your residents starts saying, hey, I've got blocks of ice making impact to the home or significant um, flooding into the first floor of home, I need to be notified of that. And I will pick up the phone and call the Army Corps of Engineers Emergency Management Division and they will in turn immediately notify the Coast Guard. That's the trigger point to get the Coast Guard um, into our area to break the ice up and relieve the water pressure in the river. So uh, moving on to the graph you have in front of you, if you look at the, as the water level starts to pick up um, basically from January all the way into June, you'll see that by the 1st of May, we will be at our high point of July of last year, 2019 where we set records uh, from June all the way through August, and the previous record was 1986. So we, we expect to start um, beating the 1986 records in February right now. So uh, we may have a long 2020 for flooding, and uh, especially if we keep having these uh, these major storms every weekend or every three or four days, as well as the southeastern winds on Lake Huron pushing that water down and holding it down in the river system. Uh, we, that's what we're looking at right now. So 
we're just we're we're working through all those things that I've been telling everybody about and and warning that's coming. It's it's arrived. It's arrived a little early at this point, but it's here. And so, what I ask all of you as leaders in the township is to make sure we let everybody know if you have sandbags already out, don't remove them, right? Leave them in place. If you need more sandbags, they need to let you know, and then you and I can talk about how we get those to you, okay? We are working with the Army Corps right now to get 12,500 more sandbags to us. Um, those right now will be for critical infrastructure, such as your sewer lift stations and things like that. If we need to figure out how to get sandbags for homeowners, you and I can talk about that in another forum. Um, and then we will talk about, we need to also talk about if, how people need to remove items from the first floor or their basement and get them to higher ground. Uh, if they don't have room in their homes, possibly moving them to another area where they can find dry storage uh, because we do know that this is happening in our waterfront areas. So uh, it's not, this is not a, it, it might happen or if it happens, this is when it happens at this point. And we know that it happened last weekend and there's going to be a time where there's going to be some permanency to this for a couple of months at least. So, um, so the, the time to take action is right now. So I just wanted to get out here. And, and I apologize for having to cancel in December. Uh, we had a, a little issue in another area. And, with the ferry. And with the ferry. So I apologize about that. But, uh, so I know we talked about these two things. I'm also here to, to answer any other questions, anything else in our division or in my programs. Um, yes, are you, sir. Are you predicting the water levels be higher than they were last year? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. We're going to have some major problems. Yes, sir. So, knowing that, we're all in it together, right? So, uh, I'm available to support all the communities, and we do that in a teamwork effort. Uh, and we will probably open up the EOC in some sort of fashion here in the next couple of weeks, I expect as we start seeing those water levels get over break walls and start seeing it, it kind of take shape. Uh, we won't be in, in a full activation, but we'll be in a modified activation, I expect. And we'll take those requests for resources and requests for help and, and manage it accordingly. As you Mr. Bryson on the phone with you a lot. Uh, Colony Drive was... Yeah, I was over there today. Colony Drive was underwater. Well, not underwater, but it has standing water, pooled water. And I think right now the water, sorry, the water's coming up uh, from the storm, storm drains. Storm. So they had them plugged last year. They I did. I was working down there. They were eight inches below the water level. They are. Where we were driving. And I don't know how they're going to hold that back because all they had was those booms in the people's yards. And I don't know. At some point, you're not going to hold it back, right? It's just happening and then we'll recover from it after it happens. And I think at some point we'll get to that. Uh, we're gonna, everyone together, the communities together are gonna do the best they can until we can anymore. Is there a future forecast when this is supposed to go back the other way? Not necessarily. Uh, like I was saying, and I don't think you were here yet, this is the second wettest Michigan's ever been since 1918. Right now we are 175% saturated at ground level right now. So. There, the state of Michigan as a whole cannot accept any more water. It just runs off and gets into the waterways at this point. I know, because it comes and goes. I remember back in 71, 72, all the same for the Corps of Engineers down Anchor Bay Drive, and we were pushing water bumpers in with the trucks. Right. And, and one other fact. So in 1986, the, the flood number was plus 54 inches. In 2018 and 2019, that flood number is about plus 60 or plus 61, and that's that's called inches above low water datum, right? So we know that it takes about plus 61 inches above low water datum to start flooding, which is where we are today due to mitigation strategies and better building codes and the land built up better and things like that. So that's why last year it didn't feel like we flooded as bad as we did in 1986, even though the water level was much higher. Um, but we do know that this year we expect anywhere from 9 to 12 inches, potentially higher, and we know that we will flood much more than we did last year. So, uh, especially since we're building water so much earlier right now. I mean, it's January and we're already struggling. So, uh, so that's kind of where we are. And, and like I like to tell everybody, I'm not going around trying to scare people 
Um, I'm going around armed with the data so that we can all be in the same boat and we can, we can make sure our residents and our communities know what's going on early and often so that we can be best prepared so we're not surprised at the end of the day, okay? How many inches of snow would that have been Saturday? It would be between 36 and 48 inches of snow. I was wondering about Within that. Within 12 hours. It would yeah. have been bad. Yeah, it would have yeah. been. It would have. So the National Weather Service out of Grand Rapids, who was kind of leading the whole charge for the state, they said that it, it could have brought the state to a halt for five or six days. Oh, yeah. I would so, imagine. Yeah. Because it all would have happened within 12 hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought about that. That would have been awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... It was uh, an eventful three days, three or yes. four days. Yes. So. Uh, any other, like I said, any other questions on any other programs? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. What month last year did we, did we see water levels that you're seeing now? How far in front of last year? So we started seeing the water levels rise in April. Well, we started seeing some spot flooding in February. Um, just because the river started backing up a little bit with ice, but we really started the water seeing the water pick up in April, and by the middle to end of May, we started getting up into the 577s, and that's when that's when I declared an emergency on May 25th. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then we we requested a governor declaration on August 12th, and it was summarily denied. Okay, I All guess right. uh, if no one has anything else. Mr. Burns, you okay? Yeah. Okay. How come it was denied? Uh, she denied all six requests that went to her, with the exception of the city of Detroit. Really? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Gonna fix the damn roads. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. Yes, your thank you. your presentation, and we might invite you back again. It's my pleasure. Thank you, sir. Good advice there from uh, Justin Westmiller. We uh, thank you very much for tuning into this edition of uh, the Focus Program. Just a quick reminder that uh, LaCroix with uh, Dan Lockwood is coming up for uh, the Bootlegger Balladeer and the uh, Poet Laureate uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, the 7 p.m. at LaCroix. 7 p.m. at LaCroix. So that's it for this edition of the Focus Program. Till next time, I'm Paul Dingaman. See you soon. Thanks for watching Focus with Paul Dingaman. Focus is produced at the CTV Community Television Studios in St. Clair. For over 20 years, CTV has captured the moments that matter to our community.